so essentially, this is the, the summary of all the, all the data. And for the vast majority of cases, we saw improvements in penalty metric scores with regards to you know, pre and post uh, teaching intervention. Some, there were no changes because things were thought to be clinically okay and uh, we didn't feel that the resident should uh, change anything. And then one case, which was very interesting, was that of an optic chiasm, which had a very high negative score, <laughs> or a very low negative score, I guess, or, or something like that. Anyways, but um, essentially this was a very junior resident, and um, even after the teaching intervention, um, uh, she wasn't sure about exactly how to change it, so she didn't change it at all. But this does bring up an issue that we've noticed before, even before this project, in terms of optic chiasm, that this is a poorly contoured structure and has high clinical impact. And one of our fellows is now doing a uh, project looking at uh, trying to get multiple contours of chiasm to define best practices with regards to that. So this this uh, data, um, who you know has already had other impacts with regards to um, teaching interventions, and so chiasm is something that we're very interested in. Another clinical example of what uh, what we found in one of the cases that we did was in the prostate. You know, one of the residents undercontoured the rectum. Uh, and this uh, system was able to pick it up, and we we basically had him uh, actually after the teaching intervention, he uh, recontoured the rectum, and you can see that there was uh, rectification compared to the ex expert contour. So, so the first project was really about teaching interventions, but the the second project, in, in extension to that, looked at the issue of of contouring quality. So, so when we have a contour. It's hard to actually say whether or not that's a good contour or not. There's no real system in the literature to say, you know, that's a good contour or that's an outlier contour or et cetera. So, so what we actually did was then we actually came up with this project looking at uh, multiply contour data sets. And we had several. We had a, 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 a series of 10 lung ca cases that were contoured by six physicians and then one uh, multiply contoured prostate data set uh, provided by ROR with regards to uh, basically prostate and OAR contours. And what we did was for each set of these community contours, we created a, sta a staple or consensus contour to reflect what the, I wanna I say in, uh, in quotation marks, what the average contour should be or what the consensus would be. And what we ultimately did was then we compared each of the individual contours that made up the staple with that ultimate staple contour and you applied penalty metric scores to de derive numbers. So this then defined the community. So what we said was that the, for these cases, we had community contours and a staple contour, and this would define the acceptable variation with regards to those contouring cases. Then what we were able to do is that we had new observers not related to any of the previous community contour sets actually contour the cases as well, and then calculated penalty metric scores for those cases, and then calculate a new um, uh, penalty metric compared with that new person with the staple. And then ultimately, the the system then compared that score versus the community to actually put them on a bell curve and say whether or not that contour was, was of high concordance, moderate concordance, low concordance, or most importantly, whether or not that was an outlier compared to the community. So if you're confused by that, I ha do have a nice little graphic here that I will go through it again just to make sure that people understand what we, what we did. So once again, there is a community of contours. So you define a case, like a prostate case, for instance, and you define a community. Now, the community could be a community of experts or it could be a community of clinicians that are, you know, that are competent to practice. So you have here a whole set of contours, for instance, for a prostate of different individuals that comprise this community that you've predefined and then you have the staple contour, which is the consensus of all of those individuals. So then what you do is then you create penalty metric scores for each of these physicians. So you, you have the first physician versus staple, then you get penalty metric one. And then this is the second physician, you compare that versus staple, and then you, oh, sorry, that's penalty metric three. And then you go on and on, depending on how many individuals you have. So you have six individuals in this case, so you get six penalty metric scores. That allows you to do descriptive statistics, which gives you a mean and standard deviation. And then what ends up happening is so you've defined that mean and standard deviation, and then you have a, a seventh individual that's not part of the community, uh, contra the case, and then you have a new penalty metric score, and then you compare that versus the community. 
And so what ends up happening is that you compare that individual against the community and that patient or the person gets scored compared to this bell curve that's been created uh, um, from the community information. And what we're interested in is actually to see whether or not the, the, the contour is an outlier. And so that's entirely what we did in this research project. So here's some examples of the cases that we had. Here's a lung case. You can see the multiply contour data set that was available, both for the primary and for the lymph nodes. And on the right here is the staple contour. So this is the consensus contour of all of these contours for both of these cases. And similarly for the prostate and the, in the ROR contouring challenge, here is the multiply contour data sets that we, were, we used for this project in terms of prostate, bladder, rectum, and, um, and uh, penile bulb. And ultimately, we were able to generate consensus contours for all of these structures as well, here and here. So to recap, we had, so actually not to recap, but actually to go, go forward. So we had four physicians contour the 10 lung cases that were not involved with the community. And so we had a total of 72 comparisons that were available. And in this case, of, out of the 72, we found 16 outlier contours and 11 of which were due to over-contouring, three due to both over and under contouring. And interestingly, we caught two contours that were actually due to either missing or totally incorrect nodal contours. So it, it, there was one case where the person didn't put a nodal contour, that was easy, but there was someone else that actually contoured the wrong nodal area altogether. And so the, the system picked that up as a, as a outlier. In terms of the prostate scenario, we had six physicians that were not involved with the community contour the, the one case, and we found three outlier contours, including a missing penile bulb contour. And then interestingly, you know, there was one individual that actually contoured the inner bladder instead of the outer bladder, and actually he's a bra primarily a brachytherapy guy, and actually that's what they did at his last institution. And so we were able to actually pick this up with the, the QA2 soft, the system, that he actually systematically contoured his bladder in the inner, and the system picked that up. And then there was one individual that uh, uh, under-contoured the rectum in the upper area, and with that, the system was able to pick that up as well. So we think we actually were able to, to pick up uh, or to, to validate this type of approach with regards to contouring. We have interest in doing future validation with regards to various scenarios, including auto-contouring. So like if you have an auto-contouring algorithm, like how, does it, how well does it do compare, compared to a community of experts? You know, it is a, a form of potentially validating auto-contouring algorithms. Similarly, you know, you can have medical education applications with regards to, you know, you have multiply contoured data sets, new individuals, uh, new residents, fellows, or even new staff that come into your practice, you know, you can actually evaluate their contours compared to a group of, of, uh, of a consensus or of, of a community. And then interestingly enough, there's also a clinical trial credentialing um, uh, al uh, approach so for new clinical trials where there are rules about what should be contoured, right now what happens in terms of contouring QA is that some, if, if this happens at all actually, is you'll send us a bunch of contours and a plan and the uh, investigator or, or the investigator's delegate will look at the contours and say, oh, they look fine. Yes, you know, the plan is approved or yes, the contours are approved. But if you have a case that you'd give to your affiliate area, like affiliate doctors, that have been multiply contoured by experts in the field, you'd be able to actually see whether or not they, they actually contour the case according to your contouring rules. And it will provide a, a way of actually finding outlier institutions that you can actually then rectify in terms of a quality assurance or quality improvement uh, procedure. So getting back to a couple of those areas, like uh, this, is the, this is the example of the under contoured uh, bladder that we were able to, uh, to show you or to, to, to detect. And this was an example of an over-contoured uh, 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 nodal contour that uh, w the QA2 system uh, picked up.